Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Pazanka and Scott Parkin. Smooth Sounds of the Green and Red podcast. I'm your co host, Scott Parkin, in Berkeley, California. And as always, I am joined by uh, Bob Bazenko in Houston, Texas. Uh, really looking forward to today. We, uh, we're talking about history, which is always fun. We're talking about war and peace and empire, which is even more fun. And then, best of all, we're talking to somebody who I've known for a really long time, who's a, a great friend and, and mentor, uh, Frank Costigliola, Professor Frank Costigliola, who's also a paisano, uh, who is a board of trustees, distinguished professor at uh, national champion UConn. Uh, Frank's written a bunch of stuff. Uh, first book was Awkward Dominion, which was about uh, kind of economic policy in the 20s and 30s, which I remember reading in graduate school uh, because I'm so much younger than him. <laughs> uh, another book, France and the United States, uh, Roosevelt's Lost Alliances. Uh, but most recently, he has uh, gotten a lot of attention for a magisterial book uh, called Kennan, A Life between worlds, which is what we'll talk about today, George Kennan. Uh, recently had an article in Foreign Affairs about Kennan. There was a great review of the book about Kennan. He's also been very involved in the uh, the group of, of uh, foreign policy historians to which I belong, uh, Schaefer, the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. He and Michael Hogan, who was my advisor, uh, have edited books on kind of explaining American foreign relations, the history of foreign relations. And he served as president of, of Schaefer uh, as well. So. This is a, an esteemed scholar, did a PhD at Cornell with the legendary Walter Lefevre, and uh, has you know, become very well known since then. And so I'm, I'm really uh, happy to be talking with uh, Professor Frank Castigliola. So first, just kind of a simple, simple thing, like how did you get interested in wanting to write something this big about canon? And um, how's it different? Because you know, there's obviously a lot of stuff out there about canon. Right, well, thanks. First of all, Bob, Thanks, and Scott, thanks for having me on this show. I mean, I've been a fan of Bob Bazanko since way back, way back when. Uh, no, really, I mean, because Bob is not just a, a wonderful historian, but, you know, he's he's like a model for a lot of us in terms of his political engagement, your political engagement, and, and you know, and, and plus your paisano. But, the, you know, <laughs> it, it, all, it all hangs together. The Vito Marcantonio tradition. Yeah, there we go. Exactly. Right. So how did I get interested in Kennan? Um, actually, I remember I was sitting, I, I spent uh, a couple of years, actually, in the mid-90s at Cornell. And I was sitting sitting in the room there and just reading the long telegram, which everybody reads. And, and I was struck by the language of this. Like, it was just like so out there, so kind of, in a way, outrageous, so emotionally provocative and evocative. That I, and yet this is this is known as the realist interpretation, realist critique, you know, realist uh, uh, answer for American foreign relations problems. How could this be? How could you have such an emotional document that claimed that it's supposed to be so rational and so realist? So that got me interested in Kennan, um, who, of course, I'd read his memoirs before that. Um, and I, in a way, you know, that was in 1994. And so this book is like almost 30 years later, the culmination. And I have to say that, you know, I'm no, as Bob said, I wrote a book in the 20s and wrote a book on U.S. affairs. I'm not really interested in those topics anymore, but I still am interested in Kennan. If someone told me, someone told me that, uh, you know, here's the trove of Kennan letters you haven't seen before, I would I would take, you know, I would say, oh, good, let me see them. He, he he's, it remains interesting, partly because he, he's a paradox in a lot of ways. And and yet he's a, he's he's one of those people, I think you could say fairly, he, he was, uh, a lot of respect, an intellectual, but an intellectual, intellectual who thought otherwise. He challenged, he, he was the paragon of the Cold War establishment, who also challenged that establishment. Um, I think most of the people who listen to us are, are fairly kind of clued in, and we've actually talked about Ken before, but why don't you just, you know, kind of describe what the, the long telegram and sure, it was sure. and, and kind of how he was so central to sure. that, you know, really hardline Cold War response initially. Sure, sure. In February 1946, famously on Washington's birthday, Kennan was sick in bed, uh, as he often was. And uh, this guy lived to be 101 and was often yeah. ill. Um, and dictated to a, it's a holiday weekend because it's Washington's birthday, uh, dictated to his secretary, uh, what came known as the Long Telegram, it was a close to 6,000 word telegram, but supposedly the longest telegram ever sent to the Department of State in which he outlined how the United States should respond to Soviet advances 
at the end of World War II. And of course, the, the Russians were rolling back the German armies in 1944, 45, you know, basically saving the ass, uh, the, the butt of, of the West, right? Yeah. Um, but in doing that, they they occupied a good part of uh, of Eastern Europe and and stayed there as as the as divisions between East and West hardened. The Soviets were more determined to hold on to Eastern Europe as kind of the empire. The military uh, forces stayed there, and so by early '46, and this is like almost a year after Roosevelt had died, American policy was was shifting away, certainly shifting far away from the collaboration with Soviet Union that, that Roosevelt had pursued. Uh, and the Truman had abandoned. Uh, and some Americans were fear, fearful that if we could not collaborate with the Russians, the alternative would be war. And Ken said, no, no, you don't have to ap appease, as he put it, collaborate, or uh, go to war with the Russians. Uh, rather, uh, containment would be a, a, a middle ground by which we would block, block the further expansion of the Soviet Union, block the further expansion, particularly of Soviet influence. And we have to keep in mind here that what Kennedy really worried about a lot, and Truman, other people really worried about, was not that the Russians were going to march to the English Channel, but rather because the Communist Party of Italy was the most popular party, and the Communist Party of France was the largest, most popular party in France, partly because of the resistance to the Nazis and fascists during World War II. Because of that, there could very well be democratic elections in France and Italy and Belgium and other countries that would bring communists to power as a majority of the government. And that the governments might want then to collaborate you know, more with the Soviet Union. That was the danger that had to head that off uh, to try to try to win over the Western Europe to the United States and block Soviet expansion either politically or militarily. And then in 1947, Kennedy published in Foreign Affairs, sometimes called the most famous article ever published in that uh, journal, uh, the so-called Mr. X articles, because it's published anonymously, in which he basically laid out the same kind of argument, calling for containment. Now, one thing I should say here is that is that Kennan claimed forever after, except in 1996, near the end of his life, when he kind of said, oops, but he claimed for years and years that he had meant containment to be through political and economic means. Political means like forming uh, you know, associations and, and especially economic means for the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was really his major, uh, major achievement in, in this, rather than through military means. You know, he, the, the, he, he later said that uh, the, uh, interpreting containment to mean an American military buildup was a misinterpretation of what he meant. But, but, but uh, we can go into this in detail if you want. Can it present a, in the long telegram and in the Mr. X article, presented the Soviet Union as not just a challenge, but as an existential threat. And again, that goes back to the language in which he portrayed it as a fanatical political force. You could not even people; it's a political force. You could how could you deal with it? Uh, so naturally, Americans, after have have, having just won, you know, a global war through military force thought, yes, okay, this existential threat requires us to build up our military again and confront it with the military as well as political and economic weapons. And But Kennan, until 1996, never acknowledged that he was in part responsible for that militariz militarization of the Cold War. Yeah, it was And then America stuck to the, that policy of containment. Policy of containment became the basis for US policy. And also, the, I should just conclude this little section here by saying that at the end of... Um, the Mr. X article in 1947, Kennan predicted that eventually containment eventually would lead to a mellowing, a mellowing or collapse of Soviet power. And then when that happened in 1991, I mean the storyline was, you know, complete, perfect. Yeah. You know, when it became, it, it kind of uh, cemented Kennan's reputation as as this boy genius who would <laughs> figure out a way to deal with the Soviet threat. Thank you. How did how did the Truman administration respond to the the long telegram and, and to the well Mr. X you know article? yeah first of, first of all also that that long telegram basically had been queued up by Kennan's friends in the State Department who knew that Kennan for a variety of reasons that I can discuss was was pissed off at the U.S. government pissed off at the Soviet government um, you know wanting to get out of Moscow at that point they kind of queued it up and Kennan you know swung the the, the, the club golf club you know. As, with all his might and and hit you know, mixed metaphors, hit hit a home run or a hole in one, whatever. Um, partly because of the persuasiveness of the language and so forth. So it came at the right moment. It's one of those things like Frederick Jackson Turner's uh, the significance of the frontier. 
Okay, so that's an idea a lot of people had was floating around, but or Henry Luce's American Century ideas that are floating around, then someone, you know, encapsulates it in a in a provocative statement and becomes associated with their name. So the Truman administration was receptive to this, to, to say the least, partly because it's friends of the State Department, but also um, James Forrester was Secretary of the Navy, later the first Secretary of Defense, later jumped out a window because he afraid the communists were coming after him. Um, there's a brief history of the Cold War right there. Um, okay, so Forrestal thought this was wonderful and sent it, a, in, in, encouraged Truman and others to send the document around. So uh, everyone, almost everyone in the Truman administration read it. And then on March 5th, 1946, like three weeks or two weeks later, March 5th, 1946, coincidentally, the same day that Churchill gave his Iron Curtain speech, and you can see all this is coming together in terms of the incipient Cold War. Uh, the State Department sent the long telegram to every diplomatic post of the United States around the world. So it became the official U.S. Uh, statement of how we were going to deal with the Soviet Union. I mean, this so, is a... And, and Stalin, you know, had spies throughout the U.S. government as well as the British government. Uh, St Stalin soon had a copy of it himself, and there's marked up copies of his underlining this and whatever. I mean, this this really becomes the guidepost for a fairly aggressive Cold War policy. And uh, but Kennan, you know, I, I think in many ways is the left's favorite imperialist. His background was a little more kind of nuanced than what you might think based on like the long telegram or sources for the conflict. You know, talk a little bit about that, because apparently I haven't I've been able to read your book yet. But so it's like the first half is based on his early career, which I think is different than most of the stuff we see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's his. Uh... And in here, the, the book is called The Life Between Worlds, and it really is in a lot of ways. Um, started out, you know, Kennan's uh, foundational trauma, foundational narrative, traumatic narrative, tragedy of his life is that his mother died two months after he was born. And that was particularly difficult because um, his family was divided, after, particularly after that. His father and his 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 father and his maternal relatives did not get along. They lived in this close by. Kenny spent a considerable amount of time with the maternal relatives. Um, and so he was divided. And I could talk about this, but there's there's the households were divided by temperament, by financial circumstances. The finances are kind of an interesting part of Kenny's early life. Uh, and then just as a brief summaration here, Kenan's father, Kent Kenan, uh, was an expert on the income tax. Uh, and in fact, he testified, his testimony to the U.S. Uh, Congress was one of the means by which the 16th Amendment was passed to the U.S. Constitution, uh, enabling an income tax to be levied in the United States, because otherwise it violated the Constitution. So here's the tax lawyer, okay? Think about this, a tax lawyer in Houston, Berkeley, a tax lawyer, right? Income tax lawyer, at a time when there was a significant, if you were really wealthy in Milwaukee, where they lived, the state income tax and federal income tax in really wealthy totaled 25%. So that was a take, right? Here's a tax lawyer who was had no money. I mean, he made so little money from his, and why I'm not really clear. He made so little money from his business as a, an attorney that he depended for household expenses on the income from the inheritance that George and his three sisters had from their mother and their mother's family which led to t further tensions between the mother's family and the father who wondered why he, they couldn't, he couldn't make a living. And then, and then the father married this kind of, you know, quintessential mean stepmother uh, who, who couldn't understand, didn't like boys and was an incredible prude. Uh, when well, she later got pregnant, she had one pregnancy, later got pregnant. Um, she was just totally embarrassed to tell anyone about it. And the, so the baby's being born was a surprise. To almost everyone. I mean, in any case, this is the household Kennan lived in. And then they, at, when he was 13 years old, they had him skip a grade and sent him to a the model child, uh, sent him to a military school that specialized in problem boys where he was bullied like hell. And then later went to Princeton and so forth. Um, so it was kind of a mixed bag as his childhood. And, but it, it also led to kind of, and I could talk about this in detail, led to kind of like a complex emotional conflict between Kennan, within Kennan, within Kennan, between, I think what you can, uh, you know, uh, the different ways to, to describe that conflict. Uh, he later became a devotee of Freud. Kennan became the devotee of Freud, read Freud in Vienna in 1934. 
and it and basically it adopted Freud's uh, uh, nomenclature for this. That's kind of so there's an inherent conflict for men, and of course men are the only people who count. There's an inherent conflict for men between eros and civilization. Eros being the force of not just sexual freedom, but uh, creativity, art, uh, vibrancy, all kinds of creative, out of the box, rebellious kinds of things, and civilization, which is obligation, duty, family, and so forth. And Kennan felt impulses toward both those and veered back and forth between them. You know, um, <clears throat> Ken, you know, Kennan is very much like an, an outsider toward to like this Washington establishment, uh, right. particularly later, later in life. And I'm, I'm just kind of <laughs> curious about how he it, partially based on what you're talking about with his with his early life, how, you know, how does that develop? How does, you know, how does that play out? Well, I think, you know, Kennan, I mean, when he became head of the, pol the director, the founding director of the policy planning staff in 19, May 47, with an office next door to Secretary of State George C. Marshall. I mean, that was an inc incredible coup, right? I mean, he's basically, his purview now is U.S. foreign policy and, and wrote many uh, policy planning staff papers, which became the basis for U.S. policy in the late 1940s. So on the one hand, he's incredible, has a very powerful position. And Marshall thinks the world of him and so forth. On the other hand, Kennan was not a bureaucratic uh, infighter, not a bureaucratic player. On weekends, when Washington socialized, Washington elites socialized among themselves, Greg Herkin wrote this wonderful book called The Georgetown Set and so forth. Kennan and his wife and family went off to their farm in East Berlin, Pennsylvania, where, um, you know, they basically, that's where they were. Uh, and Kennan, Kennan thought, as his son told me, and I think that's true, that Kennan thought he was basically, um, he was elitist in many, many ways. They thought he was really too good and too smart and too prescient to have to you know, go in there and claw his way in terms of bureaucratic influence. So he was later, uh, with Dean Acheson became Secretary of State in January 49. Acheson was not so enamored. He, he respected Kennan initially, but was not so enamored of Kennan as Marshall had been. And Kennan's influence and the influence of the policy planning staff uh, declined. And it's significant that by 1950, Kennan basically left the State Department, went on a leave of absence, and never really returned after 19, early 50 to, to the State Department. Yeah, Kennan is obviously like a huge figure in, in what we study. I mean, like probably the first thing, I, one of the first things I read in graduate school was, was Kennan's book on uh, the Russian Civil War, you know, because who intervened. Right, right. Um, that period from like before 1950, though, he's really critical and, and, and in some ways kind of, you know, pivotal and heroic to, to the people on the right who waged the Cold War with the long telegram and famous PPS 23, right? We have right. only 6% of the population, 50% right, right. of the wealth, and our goal is to maintain this right. disparity. Um, and so, you know, he's, you know, really, you know, really pivotal in, in creating that antagonism, that growing tension. Uh, between the Soviet Union, I think you and I, we could talk about it, actually both believe that, that that wasn't necessary at the time. But what kind of creates that flip in him where he kind of catches himself, says, oh, you know, because at first he says he was embarrassed to uh, the long telegram. What did he compare to like a DAR or a John Birch Society right, right, pamphlet right, right. or something right, like right, that? Right, yeah. Right. What what created that flip in him? When did he say, oh, you know, I, I may have unleashed something, you know, that, that we can't really control now? I, the way I see it, in a way, I mean, the way I see it, in a way, the kind of the, the, the anomaly is Kennan the Cold Warrior. In a way, that's the anomaly. In a way, because I you have to look specifically at the reasons why, again, a lot of it's personal, why he was so vehement in, in the long telegram. Uh, and, then he's, and, and, then, and then, you know, he's brought back to Washington. He's, he's a, a, a lecturer at, and deputy commandant of the National War College. Kennan, Kennan likes power. I mean, my bumper sticker about Kennan He's a person of incredible talent, just absolutely incredible talent. But the only thing greater than his talent was his ambition, right? So when he's back, brought back to Washington, May 46, and that year, 46, 47, he's again giving lectures to, to people who are generals and, and colonels and people like this. And he's in that Washington, and people want, everyone wants to, you know, give him, he wants to, he's invited to give lectures at Harvard, Princeton, Yale, invited. It, it, it's, his head is, gets a little big, I think. And one, one aspect of, one, in this, in the atmosphere of the 
increasing, worsening Cold War, Kennan is flowing with the tide, I think, and he's kind of caught up in it. But as early as, as I say in the book, as early as, as February 1948, which is only six months after the publication of the Mr. X article in July 47, by February 48, I think he's beginning to kind of rethink things and beginning to think his always, you know, his impulse was to try to have some kind of association with the Russians. Now he says, well, maybe we should consider diplomacy. Maybe we should consider diplomacy with, with Stalin, particularly with regard to diffusing the growing confrontation in occupied Germany with American and Russian forces, and particularly that he should conduct that diplomacy, which is always Kennan's ambition. I mean, I think his ambition throughout his life was that he and Stalin or he and Khrushchev or he and Brezhnev would sit down and arrange everything, you know, right there. Speaking mm -hmm. in Russian, they would handle it. Um, so it's significant that he suggests that in, in February 48, in a way. And then after that, from February 48 to 1988, more often than not, he's saying, well, we should, well, this is, well, we should try to negotiate, or we should, let's look at, I think the thing is, Russia, Kennedy loved the Russian people, and he disliked, despised the Soviet government. But, but in his love for the Russian people, he could not help but, to some degree, empathize and understand the perspective of the Soviet government. Even though we disliked th that government in a lot of respects, he could see where they were coming from. He could see in a way that pressures the United States was putting on them, pressures that he was contributing to, but he also saw the reverse side of what the US was subjecting the Russians to. So it's complex. I mean, that's why he's, he's fascinating because you have, you know, here's a cold warrior who's also a cold war critic. And one, one other thing I think that I think I've come to think, think about, and that is people say with justification, why all this attention to Kennan? I mean, after all, his period of influence ranges max from 46, 1946 to 49, you know, or even not so much even to 49. Why? You know, I think we have to regard Kennan as a phenomenon. He's a phenomenon. And this, this podcast is an aspect of that. People, particularly historians and political scientists, are fascinated with someone who is a, a player, a political player, diplomat, and also someone who reflects on that, you know, as, as a scholar, someone who's contradictory in the ways that, that I've said. And also, Kennan dramatizes himself. He dramatizes himself in his memoir and in his interviews with Gaddis and, and other things in his life. Um, and to, I'm not sure to, to what degree he's intentionally dramatizing himself, but he does. He certainly does. And so it's a phenomenon. I'm, I'm kind of curious. In the in the book, you 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 have a you have a take. You, you know, he's not just a creature of the of creating containment, but he's, you know, you talk about him as actually as an early environmentalist. And then right. you also talk about him as an early peace advocate because he's particularly concerned about atomic nuclear exchange right. between yeah. the Soviets and, and the US. And I'm I'm wondering if you could actually talk about his thoughts on that and how that maybe influenced him during this period. Right. Yeah. Let me just amend what I just said. It, he's not just a phenomenon. He's a spectacle. And I think that's part of it. That's <laughs> what we're all, we're all caught up in. Um, yeah. I mean, to me, that was the really interesting thing. Kennan, Kennan as, well, as the early environmentalist, I mean, that's that's clear. He's uh, he's in, you know, he's concerned about the destruction of, of he's appalled by what he sees happening in the, in the Potomac River in the 40s when he go when he when he's living in Washington. Um, I mean, he says at one point, you know, he's very much worried about prospect of a nuclear war, but he says at one point, well, you know, one positive thing is we get rid of human beings that allows nature to restore itself, eventually restore itself. And, you know, and, and he quoted, he quoted Bullet. I don't know why Bullet said this, but he quoted William Bullet saying that uh, humanity was a, a skin disease on the surface of the earth. There's some, some extreme. <laughs> and they're like a 1950s movie, sci-fi movie, The Day That Earth Stood Still, that has that same thesis. Right, right, right. Um, but what's interesting to me, okay, you know, more than in a way anything, in terms of Kennan's being an original, uh, being a critic, and, and unlike, you know, these other Cold Warriors, he became a critic of the Cold War, but also more fundamentally a critic of our industrial modern society, because Kennan uh, imbibed from Chekhov uh, the idea that, and I think this is a fascinating idea, that the real problem, the real problem in modern society is not that workers are exploited by corporations, or workers are exploited by Communist Party bosses, or workers are exploited by whomever is running the factory, but rather that it's industrial production, 
and I think you would say te technological dominance, that itself is the problem. And Kennedy believed that industrial production and the kind of mass, mass, uh, ma particularly mass production, particularly depending on machines for all kinds of things, is screws up the way human beings should relate to each other and should relate to nature. And, and that's, you know, that's certainly idealistic, but I think it's also a, an interesting corrective uh, into, and in some respects, as I said, in the book, it's like, you know, it's some, especially some people talking during the COVID that, you know, how this is uh, inspiring or forcing people to rethink the aspects of their lives and what they're doing and what, you know, what's important and so forth and, and handicrafts versus, uh, you know, store-bought things and so forth. Kennan is kind of like a, a pioneer of that, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, is this really what, what we want, uh, how we, we want our lives to be dominated by, by this kind of alienating, alienating force of mass production and technology, technologically driven uh, uh, interactions? I mean, just little things, little things like, you know, when, in, in, and, and I, I remember that, I'm old enough to remember this, when it used to be when you made a telephone call back in the early 50s, you made a telephone call. You had to, you picked up the phone and the operator came on and the operator put, you, you gave the operator the number. And then that was replaced by electronic uh, dialing in the mid fifties sometime. Kenan noticed that and said, you know, even though that it was so, that human interaction with the operator was so nominal and so narrow in a sense, still it was human interaction, all right? And then that's replaced by the electronic dialing. So. I think in various ways, he's, he's uh, that's something to think about. And that's what an intellectual should do, right? Give us something to think about. Well, you know, he had a piece in foreign affairs like in the eighties where he said that as, you know, was, you know kind of Reagan is ramping up the, the, the new Cold War, the reinvigorated war. And Kennedy said, you know, as bad as this is, as bad as this kind of may have even been in the nuclear delusion. I, I'm not even sure it may have been in there actually, but he said, I'm even more frightened by the prospect of, I don't know if he used the phrase global warming, but that's what he said. And that struck me. I think that may have been the first time, you know, I've seen that kind of idea articulated. And I think as, as a lefty and as someone who's kind of a, maybe not the first generation of the new left, clearly, you know, influenced by, by you and, and so many others, I think what's fascinating about him is, is that apostasy, or I think you call him an unsung hero where, you know, unlike most of these guys who go to their graves, you know, never recanting a thing, Kennan, you know, I think really was able to reflect on, on what he did. And, and, you know, I just kind of wonder how that came about. And then like, kind of specifically, like, you know, cause he starts talking, I think about the, the, uh, the arms race in the fifties, and then he's critical of Vietnam, you know, uh, not long after that. Right. Right. Um, well, you know, I think Kennan and, and again, it's a mixed bag here. Kennan, in some respects, is the creature of, of the or product of the early 20th century in the United States. And so, in a way, his, his idea is the U.S. should be like, uh, I mean, pre-1940 foreign policy, uh, he agrees with Stephen Wertheim here in a lot of respects, pre-1940 U.S. policy is, is, is not a bad idea that the U.S. should, should hold itself back from in, engagement in, in m many aspects, not everything, but in many aspects. He was initially opposed to NATO because he thought it was to militarize our relations with, with, with Western Europe. I mean, he always a fa a, a favored a united Germany, neutral united Germany, not part of uh, uh, either the American or the, or the Soviet sphere. Um, so, okay, but in terms of war, I think the real turning point here is when he, he, he loved pre-war Hamburg as a city, just the, the vibrancy of the you know, port city with just so much going on and, you know, just, and lived there for a while and, and really loved pre-war uh, Hamburg. He said he, he could, uh, when he was in that city, he could hear the music of the city. And it's kind of this mystical aspect of Kennedy too. And then he visits Hamburg in, in, I always forget, 1948 or 49, I think 48. And it was, of course, the firebombing, right? Totally destroyed. And he, and he comes to the conclusion that nothing, not even winning World War II, nothing is worth this kind of destruction. And that, and that makes him a skeptic of, not all military force, but I'm facing a, a, a from the get go skeptical about wars, and and then Vietnam. I mean, he sees that as why what what are we doing that for? I mean, Cannon partly because of, you guys said early 20th century influenced him. He has he has he's a racist. I mean, I, you, you could say that you could say that he's a racist in many ways. But part of that is thinking Southeast Asia, if the communists take it over, good, it's their problem. 
what do we need it for? I mean, it's that that kind of attitude. Only certain parts of the world are important. Most of those parts that front the North, uh, the North Sea, you know, and uh, the people who count, not like you and me. And um, uh, he famously said, I love this. He said, he was uh, he was in Italy, traveling around Italy, and he said, now I understand why New Jersey has so many problems. <laughs> so, okay, but there's a kind of way in which, all right, that we shouldn't worry about these various yeah. benighted parts of the world and yeah. let, let them do whatever they want, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and he, also, a... he, he was, excuse me, he was a skeptic of empire. He did, after reading Edward Gibbon on these long transatlantic flights during World War II, uh, he thought, you know, empires don't last, whether they're based in Washington or Moscow or Rome. They're, it's just a fool's game because they don't last. You know, uh, you know, in the last decade or even more, we've seen a lot of documents come out of the old Soviet Union and, you know, even kind of American declassifications, which kind of tell us that in the, you know, really by 1945, 46, the Americans understood that there's, there's this massive gap in power, right? And despite the rhetoric of how evil, you know, apocalyptic evil the Soviet Union was, they knew that the Soviet Union wasn't really you know, uh, Core International History Project put some great stuff out on that. You know, Core wasn't, I mean, the Soviet Union wasn't in any position to really cause the U.S. problems, not even just in, you know, in the, in the English Channel, you said, but really anywhere, you know, yeah. and they were able to take care of Italy with like $100 million to the Vatican and Mafia, right? Right. Um, did, was Kennan aware of that, 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 you know, the rhetoric really had kind of outpaced reality that even though the U.S. was talking about this Soviet threat that, you know, realistically, they knew that that the U.S. had such overwhelming power at the end of World War II that that wasn't really a... a he, he was, he was aware issue. of that. But as I said, I think during that, much, particularly 46, 47, and even into 48, he's he's swimming with the tide. And he's, yeah. you know, and he's he's buying into the buying into the, the threat rhetoric. But keep in mind also... That however weak the Soviet Union is, as a even as a military power, it, the appeal of communism, which we yeah, forget yeah. about today, right? Yeah. The appeal of, of communism to, to impoverished Western Europe was yeah. was powerful. And the fact that the Soviet Union is poor and relatively poor, well, that makes it more aspirational mm -hmm. as a society in terms of Western Europe, where people it's oh, they're also poor. And the United States is this kind of you know un, you, they can cannot hope to achieve the level of yeah. the United States. The Soviet Union is more like that kind of people in a, in a no, sense. No, that's, that's clearly, uh, you know, I, I taught in Italy a couple of times and I was amazed because these 18, 19 year old students were asking me all about, you know, um, uh, Pagliari and De Gasperi. And yeah. so I had to go learn it to talk to them, you know, and, you know, the right, U.S. Right. spent like a hundred million dollars in between 46 and 40 in Italy. So yeah. I think that's kind of one of the stories of the Cold War that, you know, like it really was this rejection of the democratic left. Uh, that's I think right. Right. And, like Gabriel and, Coca, and, you know. and encouraging Italian Americans to write letters back to, yeah. to Italy and the aid ships in the harbor, which weren't going to yeah. unload unless they voted the right way in the yeah. election. Yeah. Well, I know you and I are enough to remember when Italian Americans were actually fairly sane and before they kind of became like Sam Alito and, you know, I, like I know, that. I know. I mean, it's just, I wouldn't even get into that. I mean, if you look to who's the leadership of the Republican Party, Time and again, time and again, time and again, they're Italian Americans. I know it's it's terrifying. I'm sorry, but anyway, that was my. Yeah. Well, at least Pompeo's not running, so we we went right, around him, right? <laughs> a great loss, a great American. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, what other one other question I have about about Kennan, particularly sort of in the foreign policy establishment, is he's often grouped in like with the wise men of like yeah. whatever that is, and. Uh, you know, did he play within within that? You know, they would call him in during crisis crises. Uh, you know, like during the Berlin crisis during the Kennedy administration to like consult or, or whatever. Did he did he play? Was he? You know, I, he. I think you talk about him as a realist, but some of it comes across as very much like dove like sort of advice and thoughts and and approach to things. But was he within that group of wise men? Was he was he a dove? Was he someone who was advocating for? He, he diplomacy? was. And he was yeah, he was. And I think it's also that, um, I mean, there's a, I, I think I mean, the, the word, words that come to my mind is, you know, like with Nitz's comment that uh, Paul Nitz's comment, that Ken is a sentimental poet. There's a way in which I, 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 and I think it's fascinating because it says a lot about American society. The Kennet as the grand strategist of the Cold War, 46, 47, 48, you know, the wise, he's, he's, he's certainly one of the wise men, the wisest, so forth. But Kennan, as a critic of the Cold War, well, he's unrealistic, you know, he's a sentimental poet. He's, you know, he loses cachet. Um, there's, a, there's a moment uh, that I described a little bit in the book. And um, it's, I think, February 61, 
when Kennedy Kennedy is putting together his administration, and um, uh, you know uh, Chip Boland's wife uh, Avis Boland, who's and their daughter is New York Times columnist and stuff. Anyway, um, Chip Boland's wife Avis Boland was Charlie Thayer's sister, and so there's and in Charlie Thayer's papers, there's a letter that Avis wrote. In, from February 1961, in which she said, how excited, how wonderful it was for Chip, because Chip Bolin, you know, becomes ambassador to, to France, and um, and uh, uh, Tommy Thompson, who's ambassador to Russia, and Dean Rusk, and Bundy, and Kennedy, they're all, they spent hours, hours in the White House, kind of basically, you know, talking about what's, what's our possible approach to Russia, you know, what's, what, what should we, how should we map out the administration's approach to Russia? And Ken is not included in that. Um, Ken was asked to become ambassador to, to Poland, to Yugoslavia, he chose Yugoslavia. It's, you know, Ken is not one of the, and even in the Berlin crisis, he, in the Berlin crisis, Ken is not a major player, basically, he's not. In the Berlin crisis, Ken, as ambassador to Belgrade, strikes up his own back channel to the Kremlin, through the Russian ambassador to Belgrade. And they start talking until Dean Rusk shuts that down. And in fact, Kennedy had asked to be allowed to go to Moscow in 61 to you know, basically finagle a bit, you know, about, about Berlin. And Rusk shuts that down too. So I think Kennan is somebody for them, for, I think for most policymakers, particularly after what happened, we can talk about this, but what happened to him as ambassador in 1952, his credibility is, is damaged. And Kennan is someone you can't ignore. Again, the spectacle. You can't ignore him, but you don't take him completely seriously either. And I think that's this is one way, this is one way that the Cold War establishment keeps this narrative and the story and the policy history. And I, let me say here, for those people, you know, this is in a way revealing anything in my part. You look at the reception of John Gaddis's book, okay? Front page, Sunday New York Times book review, front page review. Um, reviewed every place, okay? Conferences held to discuss this book. I will say, maybe my maybe my book isn't as good. I don't know, although I think it will case. I won't even comment on that. All I'm going to say is my book, which Gaddis's book upheld containment as wise and necessary and successful and so forth and so on. That view of Kennan, the conventional Kennan. My view book highlighting the unconventional Kennan, Kennan the Critic, um, not reviewed in the front page of the New York Times Book Review. Yeah. Well, we would never have John Gaddis on. So. Right, right. <laughs> right, that's right. That, that balances it. That balances well, it. Well, and, you know, and, and I think, but that's kind of reflective, right, of Kennan as well, right? I mean, you're right, kind right, of taking right, this right. view that, you know, is kind of in, in many ways now for a lot of people quaint. I mean, we could talk about, you know, our field even, but um, you know, I noticed like in the, I guess it was around the 80s, Kennan seemed to kind of resurface and the media kind of went him a lot. And this is when he wrote The Nuclear Delusion. And uh, I, I mean, was it, I mean, even before that, he spoke out about um, Afghanistan, you know, in, in, in pretty prescient ways. And that's the word I often use when I write about kind of prescient, you know. Right, 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 um, right. But I mean, I think Afghanistan was really, you know, do you want to you want to talk a little, because this is something Americans, when I teach in class about the U.S. role in Afghanistan and why the Soviet Union intervened and things like that. Like utterly, they know nothing about it. Right. I mean, Kennan pointed out that if Afghanistan is on the route to the Persian Gulf, um, that's, a, <laughs> that's a pretty tough traveling, pretty tough, <laughs> tough travel. Tra and he pointed out that it was basically a defensive move um, on, 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 on the part of the Soviets, and the Carter administration was uh, over overreacting. I mean, now he's a voice of reason there. Um, but again, the voice of reason. But who's who's make who's appointed the you know, Nitsa is the one who becomes the policy yeah. advisor to to, uh, to Reagan, not not George Kennan. Kennan is listened to, but as I put it in the, the book, honored but not heeded. And, and 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 actually, those two things are not contradictory; they're kind of complementary. Because in honoring Kennan, it's a way to not not heed him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, you also were. I mean, I, I think we're going to talk about this in a minute. But like, you also refer to that when you know he's he's asked to go to this to Russia with you know, the Clinton administration, and he's advocating for no expansion of NATO eastward or expansion of NATO period. And you know, he's honored, but not heeded. And it, it just seems like, it just seems like that there's this point where 
they knew he was a critic, but he's also older. And so they've just decided to like, we're going to lift this person up who came up with this policy, but then like not really listen to anything else he has to say. Right, right, right. Where he really was wise. I think that's the thing that I discussed, I guess, in the, in the foreign affairs piece. I mean, he was right. He, 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 and he pointed out, I think, I think it's incredible pressure. He's talking about a Ukraine, a NATO basically mucking around with Ukraine in the Black Sea in 1997. Okay, this is not 2014, you know, we could go on talking about Putin or so forth. This is back, way back, you know, democratic Russia and they're, and they're beginning to show, as Kenneth points out, if you, if you want the Russians to believe that the expansion of NATO is not a threat to their interests, why, why is NATO getting involved in Ukraine? This is 1997. So, uh, you know, I think it's incredibly prescient in, in terms of, uh, and, and this is something, of course, that is ignored in the American uh, press uh, that the you know the, the steady advancing advancement advancement eastward of NATO uh, would be, uh, of course, is regarded as a threat by by Russia. As a, the story, I, I, you know, the analogy I give is let's say China had an alliance with Venezuela, right, and then China is military alliance, and then begins negotiating with some. Central American countries who are interested in joining that alliance, you know, and they advance, you know, so El Salvador and so forth, Nicaragua, and then and then China, Mexico would like to join. Yeah, how's the U.S. going to respond to that? Well, we know. I mean, it's even presenting that as a question, <laughs> you, you know, how the U.S. is yeah, going to sure. respond to it. When when the Soviet Union kind of fell apart, and then kind of U.S. capital rushes in, did Kennan kind of comment on that much in the early nineties? No, actually, his daughter is, is involved in kind of Ukra in Ukraine and helping oh. encourage entrepreneurship. Oh, uh, in details, I entrepreneurship did not know in 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 uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. <laughs> uh, but Kennan stressed that Russia should build this democracy as Russians want to. You know, and it, that's why I think that an aspect of Kennan. I mean, there's that comment that you that quote that you made about the six percent and the fifty percent mm. you know that's certainly valid but it's also in another way ken is not really an advocate of the of the empire and in, in, in terms of think he thinks okay that the united states if this united states is a shiny city on the hill it should remain on the hill and shining and that's what we should do <laughs> uh, we should be the model rather than trying to uh, uh impose or even you know promote our way of life in other countries and kenny would say you know that's incredibly arrogant, and, and the Russians have their own their own set of uh, their own culture, among other mm -hmm. things. So, yeah. Well, that always like because I studied Vietnam. I mean, when Americans will say like essentially we're going to bring liberal democracy to Vietnam, like they don't know what that is. I mean, right. I'm not trying to be like you know Orientalist about it, but that's not part of their political culture. Right. And right. so the US right. tries and, to impose these and, things. Yeah. And the way it translates, the way look at the way it translates in Iraq and elsewhere, it's yeah. just like it's bizarre, bizarre, <laughs> kind of bizarre, corrupt. Kind of, right. kind of government and ineffective, and unstable. That's got for you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, I, I'm just fascinated with Kennan as this sort of critic. I really, I really appreciate your book. I've, I've read some of it. I haven't got to read all, the whole thing through yet. Uh, and, and I'm just, you know, we on this show we talk a lot about cracks in the establishment or cracks in the ruling class. It's a big theme, and some come, some of it comes out of a lot of it comes out of Bob's work around you know military descent during Vietnam, and and I'm you know I I see this theme where they honor him because he's you know architect of you know stuff that happened in the '40s, but I'm I'm just kind of curious if if there was you know how how much where if it was heated anywhere if it's you know, particularly, particularly post, you know, fall of the Soviet Union, if that, if what he's talking about, you know, catches on anywhere within, especially within the establishment, or, or is the, is the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, just all com completely bought in on this, what also seems to be like, you know, containment sort of like strategies. We actually had Andrew Bacevich on uh, uh, last month, and he talked about how a lot of U.S. foreign policy is still rooted in, like, you know, policies from like the '40s, like containment, outdated, yeah. you know, right. something that needs to change. And I'm yeah. wondering if, like, anything that Kennan said really caught on with anybody, I, other I, than like people like us. Yeah, right. I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think I, I discussed in the book uh, Strobe Talbot, who adored Kennan, and, and makes it made it. Uh, Talbot made the point that when he was he was. Uh, the Russia expert, the B, Clinton's main Russian advisor, right, and Deputy Secretary of State, when when he would attend meetings of the UN General Assembly, 
uh, he would make it a point to drive from Washington to New York so he could stop by and visit Kennan in Princeton on the way and bring with him a couple of foreign policy uh, of foreign service officers so they could sit, sit at the feet of the great man and you know and, and also Talbot would discuss policy with Kennan. I mean, I think they really did have an exchange. But when all is said and done, and you can see this in the exchange, the letters that are in that foreign affairs piece, when all is said and done, Talbot became a, a noted, you know, uh, particularly vocal uh, and uh, and uh, abs not absolute, but you know, very strong uh, advocate of NATO expansion, despite despite what Kennan. Yeah. So no, I I don't think that uh, you know. I think Kennan is a champion of the people who are critic criticizing the establishment, but not the establishment, which is not a role he ever felt completely comfortable with. I mean, he's he still is, in a way, he would Kennan would love to be in the establishment, but an establishment with agreeing with him, you know. And and, and there's a there's a great little episode in, in 2003 when when the Bush Bush is about to invade Iraq or has just invaded Iraq. And he says, well, I don't think the administration is going to call on me for advice, but if they did, and, and so he's still he's still thinking. And that's what I think when like a foreign policy officer, uh, it, and I think there's one reason why he chose Gaddis as the authorized biographer, because he felt that Kennan, excuse me, Gaddis had gotten the story of the, the containment in the 40s correctly, that Gaddis understood that Kennan had meant it to be economic and political rather than military and, and so forth. So that was a story that Kennan above all what it told directly yep. as he saw it. And, and that, he, that came out in the early 80s, the Gaddis book? Uh, well, the strategies of containment, right? Which, which right. Kennan- Right, but I mean, the Kennan book, the, when, when did that come out? The, the oh, the, book the, on the 2011. Gaddis's? Yeah, yeah Gaddis's- Oh, it was actually, late, I didn't realize it was a late. No, that was, I read, the, yeah. the deal was that they signed in 1981, and yeah, again yeah, in 1990, yeah. they signed a, a contract yeah. making, giving Kennan's ex Gaddis exclusive rights to the Kennan papers, Right. And the, the idea also explicit in there was that the book would come out only after Canada. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I'm yeah, thinking yeah, strat right. strategy. But it, the strategy is containment, which is, you know, I guess has it, a lot of Kennan in there in 1981. Gaddis was like the most triumphal kind of American scholar, you know, in 90 and 91. And I've often wondered, did Kennan ever express any reservations about, you know, Gaddis? Like, hmm, maybe. Not really. No. Not really. I mean, that, you know, I mean, because I, you know, if you look at the book, I, I spend a lot of time. On, yeah. on the Gaddis Kennan relationship. Um, not really. In a way, I think, uh, I mean, it, it's just true that the, I think Kennan was kind of starry eyed with regard to Gaddis and, huh. and um, thought that Gaddis was just a wonderful historian. Uh, yeah, although, I, although, although there is, you know, and I write about this in the book too, um, when Kennan got a sense of the, 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 the Gaddis was not sympathetic to Kennan's post-1950 views yeah. as a critic of the Cold War. That was something that bothered him because he felt he felt that Gaddis, but still he respected Gaddis. He thought Gaddis was the most perceptive person, the most perceptive historian who, who would ever view Kennan's life and Kennan's record, right? Uh -huh. that, that's what he believed. <laughs> and if, if Gaddis couldn't, and he said this, if Gaddis can't get this right, he said the most perceptive, if he huh. can't get the story right, there's no hope of anyone else. Wow. So, Needless to say, anybody's Italian American. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, I, I think maybe even Mike Hogan went to something you may have been there. I don't know. A bunch of historians were there with Kennan. And, you know, he said, he said, Kennan sounded like, you know, you guys, you know, sounded like the new left. He sounded like Williams the way he yeah, was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, us. that's yeah. true. I, I think that there's, a, there's a, Tom Patterson. Tom Maybe Patterson thought, came yeah. away from one of those uh, conferences and actually wrote this to David Langbord. He said, if Kennan live, lives long enough, he's going to be revisionist. Maybe it was Tom who told said that to me too, but yeah, it was just crazy. So to, to see this kind of respect, right? But still, Gattis is still, weird. The, <laughs> right? But that's that's still there. I mean, it's still the respect yeah. for Big Addis as a story. But and and but during the nineteen sixties, even though he's like critical of Vietnam, critical of Cold War policy, he, he's actually also like at odds with the New Left, particularly like New Left yes. scholars, and right? The, yes, right. And I think that's an interesting story um, because he was critical of the New Left's. New left's being critical of U.S. policy in, in the in the you know 1946 to, to 48. Uh, he he didn't want anybody mucking around with his version of of that truth. Which that's an interesting moment there because people at that in the late 60s and I talk about this in the book. You have people like Arthur Schlesinger and Kennan, people who were kind of you know really 
at that, on the scene, there were Dean Acheson, people on the scene in the 40s who are then interacting with the new left historians. And there's a, coming, a kind of a unique coming together that moment of these two different forces, you know, kind of a passing in the night, so to speak, <laughs> of, uh, that, that's an interesting moment. Um, you know, we've, we've getting close to the end here, but you not long ago had an article in Foreign Affairs, the, what did Williams call it? The house, the house, the home and gardens of the establishment or something like that. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I love that one. But um, about how Kennan might view Russia and Ukraine. And, and, you know, we've actually chatted a bit about this. Like, this is difficult to talk about because immediately you get labeled, you know, like a Putin apologist or, uh, you know, and you have these kind of NATO liberals, NATO lefties. So, um, you want to talk a little bit about because I thought you know it was it was really important to kind of throw that out there that these are people who were saying this a long time ago you know and they're clearly not Russian patsies right so, right 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 so what did what what was the what what you know what do you think how would Kennedy look at this I mean you already talked about like NATO expansion how he warned against that yeah I I think they well I think if Kennedy were alive today he would say okay this war is very dangerous very dangerous you was U.S. unlimited aid to Ukraine. Ukraine is the 51st state. All this stuff is 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 dangerous, and that we I think he would say we need to come to we need to have some kind of, come to some kind of understanding with Russia as to the parameters of this war. I mean, it's interesting, and maybe it's to some extent a parallel situation. Um, in 1951, Kennan, at at the request of the State Department, sat down with the uh, uh, Russian ambassador to the United Nations, and basically. They laid out together what became the basis for the later the armistice talks, where Kennan said, "Look, we don't. Our aims here are limited. Uh, we want to come to some kind of agreement. We don't want to escalate this war." I think, I think the I don't know. Maybe maybe uh, Blinken is conducting this kind of diplomacy, but I think Kennan would advocate at least setting the terms for the conflict um, so that things don't get out of hand. I think he would think that the nuclear danger is extremely. Dangerous, uh, that you know, extremely dire, and that the idea of seeking an all-out victory in Ukraine is is dangerous because if you push Putin so far, um, the, obviously, you know, this might be your last podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think about you know China in, in the same way. You know, the kind of right. You mentioned you know kind of the comparisons. You know, when I think of China, Tai, you know, Thai, U.S. and Taiwan, I say, well, what if China went to Puerto Rico? And started meddling there, or started right. sending you mean, know, the head of the you know, Chinese Communist like, Party to Puerto Rico, or you know. Right. What's interesting is that how the one China policy, which is, so far as I know, maybe you can correct me. As far as I know, the United States is not formally repudiated. No, no, I, I wrote policy. about that recently. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. in the New York Times, they never never yeah. say that. Well. Rather, they refer to it as China claims. China mm -hmm. claims that Taiwan yeah. is part of its territory, and you would never know that. <laughs> No, I mean, if you go government. to the State Department's official page and it spells it out there and it even says we have three protocols and six diplomatic agreements that, you know, that, that confirm this. So, and no, I, I recently wrote about that. that that's just, it's just, you know, uh, absent from, from all of this. Right. So, I mean, that, that, a, there's a, a, a legally recognized international law, a recognized relationship there that the U.S. is just something. Right. I mean, that's an that. aggressive act. Oh, absolutely. We're, oh, absolutely. We're unilaterally, unilaterally changing yeah trying to change that situation. And, and Kennan, I think, would be aware of that. He also right. was a believer in kind of spheres of influence. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. But that you know, it's unrealistic to expect that the United States is going to be the predominant naval power in the waters around China. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just not a good mm -hmm. use of American resources. Scott? I, I had one more question, which I feel like is a little, kind of wraps it up a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. In the introduction, you actually say that Kennan actually considered himself a failure. Uh, yeah, and and I'm wondering if you could just say a couple of words about that, like just to kind of bring it. Yeah, because talk about I, together. Yeah, as I said, I think you know the only thing greater than Kennan's uh, abilities was his ambition, and he saw, you know, he thought he was prescient that he he had a lot to to give and a lot to. To add and you know to contribute to American foreign policy, and that he and that he was not able to do that beyond that brief period in forty six to forty nine. He saw that as as a um, as a failure, and that's one reason why Kennan attached such importance to who would be as to who would be his uh, biographer, because he thought, well, okay, his lifetime is, was just has one hundred one years. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not long enough for people to appreciate what he, what he might what he, his ideas are and what his policies would be. 
and you want to ex you want to extend that into the period after his life, and therefore you need the right biographer to present the story in a way that people can understand. I I think you're the right biographer. I mean, I think well, you know what you the way you describe Canyon is actually way more useful. And I would think you know he he would he's a smart guy. Obviously, I think he'd understand that that like there's this kind of flavor to his life that that's that's really important. So I really yeah. appreciate that. Well, I, thanks. Uh, I, I that that yeah. was frankly in my mind. I mean, I yeah. felt I was. I, I felt he deserved a biography that would that would take his concerns seriously. No, it's weird. Like I said, I mean, he's kind of our favorite lefty's favorite anti-imperialist, and I find myself, you know, you kind of make these compromises over the years, you know, and I find myself more and more kind of being gravitating toward the kinds of stuff he said. And you know, I mean, not not the long telegram or PPS twenty three, but it's a it's a, an incredibly fascinating figure. It still is right, and so uh, it's canon of a, a life between worlds. Princeton published it, right? Princeton University yeah, Press. They, they did. Yeah. They did. All right, and and I would encourage uh, everybody to to go out there and read it. I, uh, you know, it's hard to get grad students to read something that big anymore, right? But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, uh, this has really been fantastic, and and like I said, you know, you've been a, a great ally and friend for a long time, and um, you know, there are I think fewer of us nowadays who kind of come out of that tradition. So I really do appreciate everything you've done. Well, it's, thanks, uh, Bob. It's, it's I appreciate everything important. you do. And Scott, good meeting you. Thank yeah, you. good meeting you too. It's a real uh, honor to be on this, to be the, included among your. Uh, the your next time we'll talk about ranching because I'm fascinated by by that. By by what? Ranching. Oh yeah, yeah, the farm. Yeah, right, right. The right, farm. Right, yeah, right. I think uh, right, you know. Right, right. Which like Canada had a big farm. Too. And an Italian American uh, Johnny Appleseed here. So. <laughs> right, right. Well, we really do appreciate it. Grazie mille, and uh, okay. I you know, hope to see you again Break before up. too long. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Much, right. much thanks. Okay. Folks, you've been listening to uh, Professor Frank Costagiola uh, from the University of Connecticut, author of Kennan, A Life Bet George Kennan, A Life Between Worlds. Uh, you are listening to the Green and Red podcast. If you'd like us, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. And if you want to make a donation because you really like us, because you like the content that we give you, like, you know, new left new left history on George Kennan and things like that, uh, go to greenandredpodcast.org and hit that support button uh, or go to Patreon, Patreon and uh, patreon.com backslash greenredpodcast and make a donation. And also uh, just because we haven't uh, shut down the shout out lately, we're also part of the, the Labor Podcast Network. They do a lot of promotion of our stuff. We try to cross promote as much as their stuff as possible. So follow them on all the social medias as well. And we will talk to you again soon. Yeah.